my brother is up to something. There's a thick patch in the cornfield, the stalks so close together that I almost can't make my way through them. And in the center, my brother is constructing something. Something made of stones. I've lived on the farm my whole life. My daddy bought the land before I was born, and the farm has always been a part of my life. He taught us, my brothers, Greg, Thomas, and I, how to care for the crops and the animals, and how to harvest the crops that would make us money after he was gone. I was the oldest. It was my job to know these things. And up until a few weeks ago, Greg didn't mind helping me. That was before his 13th birthday. We'd always been close, Greg and I. We were only three years apart, and Greg had grown up at my side. We explored the woods and fields together, helped Daddy in the fields, generally told each other everything. We had separate rooms, but Greg spent most nights camped out on my floor rather than in his own bed. Being a farm kid, I never really went to school very much, especially when the harvest needed bringing in. I was that weird kid, the one who was there rarely, that no one really knew. Greg was my best friend, and I spent most of my time with him. Until very recently, that is. I watched him stack the rocks, his arms straining under the load, but the weight seemed to stop him not at all. He was making something, some kind of altar, and I didn't like the look of it at all. Where was he even getting the rocks from? The closest quarry was miles from here. There was no way a 13-year-old could... Greg looked in my direction suddenly, and I hit my belly. I did not want him to know that I was spying on him. Not after a few nights ago. He had been leaving the house in the middle of the night. It started a few days after his birthday. He had been roaming a lot lately, leaving in the middle of chores and randomly popping back up in the field. Daddy never could prove that he was shirking his responsibilities, since his chores were always done. I, however, had seen him on the edge of the woods when he was supposed to be working. I couldn't understand how he could stand so close to the woods after our last camping trip. I didn't even like to go collect firewood out there anymore. He was back to stacking rocks, and they had begun to resemble a crude stone house. They were jagged, unpolished, and I began to wonder if he had somehow cut them himself. The area he was in had been cleared of corn, the ground nothing but raw earth, and I was filled with questions as I watched him work. He must have gone into the woods for these. How, how could he walk through those woods after what had happened? How could he ever go back to that place again? Thinking about that night made me shudder involuntarily. We'd been camping that day, the day of his birthday, two of us sharing a tent as we set up not too far from the house. We were sitting around a fire, telling ghost stories and enjoying the sounds of nature as it too prepared to sleep. It had been a great day. We had swum in the creek, fished for our dinner, cooked our fish over an open fire, and now it was time for scary stories. And this was the area that Greg really shined in. I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that I'm a bit of a scaredy cat. I'm easily startled, and I'm not a fan of being scared. Most of the stories I know, I learned from books and Greg had heard them a hundred times. Greg made up his own, and they were grisly. Greg loved scary things, and it was one of the few things we disagreed on. Greg sometimes picked on me for being skittish, but I usually shrugged it off. He was telling me a story about a sound in the woods, when something did make a sound out in the woods that made me jump. Cut it out, Greg. Th that's not funny. Greg had paused in his story, whispering, I didn't do that. We both sat in silence, listening hard as the forest creaked in the growing wind. The sounds of bugs and night creatures had ceased, and all we could hear was the rustle of the August leaves and the shaking of dry limbs. Something was moving around our campsite, something large and angry that cared little for all the noise it was making, or whether we could hear it or not. We were both stuck still when the wood popped in the fire, making us jump, and then making both of us laugh at our own silliness. Then that sound came again, that throaty cry that sounded so much like Greg's cry from earlier, and the sound ululated from right behind us. The two of us were up and running, leaving the tent, our sleeping bags, and everything else behind. 
was shot off into the woods like a pair of frightened deer, and the dark forest seemed to throb around us like a fairy tale forest in one of the stories we'd been told in our youth. Suddenly, we were alone in a dark wood, frightened and scared, as our mother described it in great detail, and we were running for our lives. We knew the woods well. We had explored them thoroughly, but tonight they were strange and alien. I could see the slight glimmer of light, the intrusion of man in this otherwise natural place, and I knew that we couldn't be far from the house. That was when Greg tripped. I stopped, looking back at him as he cried. A root had snagged his foot, and he was reaching for me, calling for my help. I turned back and reached for him too, wanting to save him, but when I saw what was behind him, my scream got stuck in my throat. He could see my face, see that something was wrong, but if he ever saw it, I would never know. I tried to scream, but my throat refused to send it into the world. The creature was huge, hulking, and had its hand wrapped around Greg's trapped ankle. I'm ashamed to say that I ran. I left my brother there, and I ran. I pelted out of those woods, and I didn't stop until I was on the front porch and hollering for Daddy. I could hear him stomping up the hall as I beat on the door, throwing it open and asking me what in tarnation was going on. I told him about Greg, about how something had got him out in the woods, and he pulled on his robe and grabbed his rifle. We headed to the edge of the woods, my flashlight swinging as I led the way, but... We didn't have long to look. Greg was there, by the edge of the woods, as still as a corpse. I was scared, scareder than I had ever been, but Daddy said that he still had a pulse. We brought him home and put him in bed, hoping that he had just had a bad start and he would wake up. Mama said that we'd call the doctor in the morning if he didn't, and we all agreed to go to bed. I wanted to sleep in his room so I could keep an eye on him, but Daddy said to give him some space. I went to my own bed, racked with guilt, and hoped that he would wake up in the morning. As terrible as it sounds, now I kinda wish he hadn't. I was awoken later that night by the sound of a door opening. It was coming from Greg's room, and I rolled out of bed, thinking maybe he was confused or scared. I opened my door, but not fast enough, it seemed. As I peeked into the hallway, I heard the front door squeak ever so lightly. Was Greg going outside? I ran after him, bare feet slapping on the planks, and pushed the door open quietly. The porch was empty, the wind whistling through the rails, and I scanned the cornfield as I looked for any sign of him. I saw a white nightshirt disappear into the corn, and I lit out after him a moment later. The corn enveloped me, that sea of green all around me, and as I ran after my little brother, the ground flew up behind me. I seemed to be just behind him always. He cut left and right as he ran, trying to lose me, it felt like, and I struggled to keep up as the soft earth threatened to pull me down. We ran like this for what seemed like hours, and just as I would lose him, he would pop up again and go pelting off into the cornfield. As the sun began to peak, I finally turned around and headed for home, not sure if this had been real or just a dream. I climbed into bed and closed my eyes, just as Daddy hollered that it was time to start the day. I went to check on Greg first thing, expecting to find his bed empty. Instead, he was sitting straight up in bed, staring at the door as if he'd expected me to come in. I jumped a little, trying to laugh it off as he continued to stare at me very aggressively. He didn't necessarily look mad, which was what I had expected from him, but he did possess a very intense stare. He stared for a few seconds before I told him I was sorry about last night. I just got a little too scared. I didn't mean to leave you though. I'm glad you're safe. I thought for sure that whatever that thing was had gotten you. Greg said nothing. I understand if you're mad. I'd be mad too, I guess. I just hope we can get through this and be friends again. I promise I'll never abandon you again. I can't believe I did it that time. Again, Greg said nothing. We stared for a few seconds more before I finally told him we'd talk later and closed the door. But we never did. Greg hasn't spoken to me since he came back from the woods. He just wanders around the farm, skulking or disappearing, and 
speaking to no one except for Mama and Daddy. Tom says he's scary and won't be in the same room with him, but I'm sure it's just because he's mad at me that he won't talk to me. I started following him, trying to see where he was going, maybe catch him alone and apologize again. That's how I discovered this place in the corn, the place that he's building this whatever it is. You can come out, Bradley. I know you're there. I felt my breath hang in my throat. Greg had never called me Bradley. Only Mama called me by my full name. He had finished placing his rock and stood with his back to the corn as he scrutinized the stone dwelling. His voice sounded different. It wasn't the voice of a kid going through puberty or the voice Greg had the night he had told his scary stories. This voice sounded deep, confident. He sounded like what I assumed the demons sounded like when the pastor told us about them in church. I didn't want to come out to the field, but I found myself rising to do just that. I approached the stone structure, feeling the hairs on the back of my neck stand up as Greg turned to look at me. What? What is it, Greg? What have you done? Greg just grinned, and for a moment, I thought I could smell rain on the wind as it rustled the corn. I built it for him, Bradley. I built it just as he told me to. I, I wanted to step away, but I felt frozen by some spell as I looked at the thing. It wasn't a house. It wasn't a rock shelter, and I felt foolish for ever thinking that it was. It was an altar, just like the one Abraham had been preparing to sacrifice his son on, and my brother had built it in our cornfield on the command of him. Who is he? I asked shakily. Greg smiled. You'll see. Very soon, you'll all see. I ran from that place, leaving Greg behind again as I ran for the house. It appeared that running was all I was good at. It all started with the appearance of one unaccounted for scarecrow. Brad, where did this scarecrow come from? Bradley, my oldest son, came up and looked at the strange scarecrow. He was sitting in our west field, the cornfield, and he was sharing company with three other scarecrows. These three, however, were ones my son and I had made in the barn. One bore the long dress my wife had donated to the cause. Another bore a set of overalls with a slice up one knee that I had turned over. The third had a shirt and a pair of sweatpants from my middle son, Gregory. These three I remembered. I should, after all, since I had built each one of them. This one, though, I did not. It was a tall fellow, a wide boater hat sitting on his sack head with a pair of new-looking blue overalls and a checkered shirt in a dark blue, light blue pattern. Brad took a long look and shook his head. Nope, doesn't look like one of the ones we made, Daddy. I scratched my chin, wondering if maybe it was something one of my other sons had erected, and shrugged it off as nothing. One more scarecrow wouldn't hurt anything. The next day, however, there was a new scarecrow in the east field. My oldest and my middle son, Brad and Greg, were with me as we checked the pole beans and weeded the squash. Then, we came across a trampled patch of squashes. Three perfect footprints could be seen in the remains of what had once been a large, healthy gourd. I looked down, looking for other squashed remains of vegetables, when I saw another new scarecrow. This one was dressed in a slinky black cocktail dress, complete with a pair of strappy pumps at the bottom of the post. Someone had put lipstick and mascara on the burlap sack head to complete the illusion of a woman out for a night on the town. I called for Greg, wanting him to bring me one of those pumps to check it against the squash gourd. Greg, however, was nowhere to be found. Brad came up instead and hooked one of the shoes, bringing it over to me almost gingerly. I appreciated his help, but Brad was beginning to be underfoot a bit too much. He and Greg had always been pretty close, but it seemed the two had had a falling out recently, which meant that he had spent a lot of time glued to my hip instead. I didn't mind my son's company, but a 16-year-old boy should really be out chasing girls instead of being underfoot all the time. Greg materialized out of the field then, brushing corn silk from his hair, and I wondered when he had had time to get over to the corn. I shrugged it off, holding the pump over the mark to prove what I already suspected. 
It was a perfect match. What does it mean, Daddy? Asked Brad. He was the oldest, but he had always been kind of a scared kid. His brother teased him about it, but I was starting to feel afraid of these things as well. This whole thing was a little creepy. People wandering around and leaving scarecrows in my field at night was more than a little spooky. I looked around the rows of pole beans as if I expected to see someone crouching there and felt a chill that had nothing to do with the autumn freeze that was fast approaching. I don't know, but I intend to find out. I told my wife about my plans that night and saw her look less than enthused. So you want to sleep tomorrow, letting your sons handle the day duties so you can keep watch in the hay barn tomorrow night. That's the plan. Dale, who cares if people are leaving scarecrows in the field? One more scarecrow won't. It's not the scarecrows. These people are trespassing and damaging my crops. I can't have that. In the end, she only shrugged and told me to do what I wanted. As I made my plans, however, it seemed that our mysterious troublemakers were making their own plans. My sleep ended at about 10 o'clock as my oldest came to wake me up. Sorry, Daddy, but you're going to want to see this. On that account, he had been wrong. I didn't want to see it, but I needed to see it. Someone had ruined eight of our pumpkins. This wouldn't have been such a loss. We had a whole field of pumpkins. But these pumpkins were in the small field near the barn. This was where we grew our state fair pumpkins. We had planted 20. Of those 20, only 15 had taken. Of those 15, only 7 were left, and 2 of those 7 would have to be pulled up by their roots since they had been trampled. In the small patch, 7 scarecrows made a small circle in their midst. I helped Brad dispose of the pumpkins, and then I helped him with his usual chores. Greg was nowhere to be seen and calling for him did very little. We had nearly cleaned up all the pumpkins by the time he came wandering out of the field to ask what had happened. Greg had been a strange boy as of late. He had always been so happy and outgoing, but this season he had been very moody. He spent a lot of time in the fields, just exploring and being out of the house, and I found myself wondering if he was smoking or maybe he'd picked up a habit he didn't want us to know about. My wife said it was just a boy hitting that age, and reminded me that Brad had gotten a little moody at 13 as well. The strange part was that sometimes I almost felt like he was watching me from the crops, keeping tabs on me, watching me like I was an intruder. He helped Brad take the wheelbarrow of smashed pumpkins away, and Brad said he could handle the rest from here. They were on special leave from school due to harvest preparations, and he said that the two of them could handle the rest of today. I was up by then, though, my mind angry and my head already making plans, so I told them I would help. We found five more scarecrows, and that had only made me more furious. What in the hell was going on? Who were these people, and why were they coming onto my farm at night and making a mess of things? I didn't know, but I intended to find out. That night, I was sitting in the hay barn with a hunting rifle and a thermos of coffee, just after ten as the family was getting ready for bed. I swept around with my binoculars, not really wanting to look through the sight if I didn't need to. I didn't want to shoot anyone if I didn't have to, but I was prepared to fire into the air or near them to scare them. A good scare might convince them that this little joke wasn't worth the effort, and then I could go back to farming in peace. I reached for my cup of coffee, the thermos within easy reach, and that was when I heard it. From the field, wind rustled through the corn and the pole beans and I picked up my binoculars to see if I could see people in the crops or not. As I scanned, I heard a whispery voice, a spidery voice, and it called to me as I sat in the hayloft. I looked around to see if someone was calling up to me, but it was just me and the crops out here. It came again then, that low, scuttling voice that told me to come out, to walk amongst the corn, to stand amongst the squash told me how nice it would be to walk barefoot in the soil, and for a moment, it sounded like a pretty good idea. I had half gotten up to go do just that, and that was when I saw someone vault the back fence. I shook off the funny mumbling and sighted him in my binoculars. He was bald, a long sleeve work shirt, standing dark with sweat, and a pair of black slacks that made him look like a floating torso in the dark. He was Darius McCann, 
the bartender at the cloudy schooner. What the hell was he doing out here? The schooner didn't even close for another five hours. He should be at work, slinging suds and wrangling drunks. Not, not running through my cornfield in the middle of the night. I climbed down, taking care with my rifle as I slung it over my shoulder, and headed out into the cornfield. My flashlight looked garish as it cut through the shadows around the corn plants, but I know this field like the back of my hand. I should, after all, since I've lived here for 15 years. I've been planting corn, pumpkins, and beans since my oldest was a year old, and this is familiar ground to me. I headed out amongst the stalks, hoping to head him off, but he's not where I expected him to be. I stopped the moonlight overhead and turned in the direction he had been heading. I ran that way expecting to hear the rustle any second now. Instead, I ran smack into a post. I looked up the post and felt my hair stand up on my back. On the top of the post was a scarecrow. A scarecrow dressed in the bartender's clothes and flapping lazily in the light breeze. As I stood there, I heard others moving through the corn, taking paths at random, running off to do whatever they did that turned them into scarecrows. I'm not ashamed to say that I took off for the house. If you've never been in a tall field of vegetation with things moving around you, then you may not understand how creepy it is. As I ran, I could see faces in the rows, people peeking through the rows and looking at me from farther out. I thought for a moment that some of those faces were even familiar, but in my fear, I was fit for little more than running flat out for home. I went back inside and locked the door, needing to think about what I'd seen, already certain I had fallen asleep in the loft. When I woke up the next day, slumped across the couch, to find six new scarecrows in the field, I knew it had been no dream. That afternoon, the sheriff came to visit me. Sheriff Dunlin bore an unfortunate resemblance to Barney Fife. He had knocked on the door about noon, just as we were sitting down to lunch and he swaggered into the kitchen with all the pomp his 110-pound body could muster. He made his usual greeting, saying hello to my wife and sons, and then asked if he could steal me away, just for a minute. I promise he ain't under arrest or nothing. As we got on the front porch, he was already lighting one of those shitty home-rolled cigarettes. Sorry to pull you out of this, but I'm working on a couple of missing person cases, and I was wondering if you'd maybe seen any of them. I nodded, telling him, I would help if I could, and asking who was missing. Darius, bartender down at the schooner, walked off last night under some pretty weird circumstances. He told me that Darius had been cleaning glasses, serving the same six bar flies he'd served since nine, when he had suddenly looked out the bat wings and walked away. The regulars hadn't thought much of it, but then he never came back. He's not home, and he's not at the bar, so we're very curious as to where he might be he said as he pitched his cigarette into the dirt. I asked him what this had to do with me. Well, his truck's parked near the fence of your east field, so we was wondering if maybe you'd seen him. That, that threw me. I hadn't even noticed the truck. I haven't yet been out to the east field today, so that wasn't altogether surprising, but it did explain how he had gotten to my house so quickly. I told the sheriff that people had been coming out to leave scarecrows on my property probably a Halloween prank, but that they had been destroying my crops in the process. I said I thought I had seen him last night, even took him out to see the scarecrows, but he only shrugged and rolled a new cigarette. Sounds like kids playing tricks. I still can't imagine what Darius was doing in your field, but I still need to find him. If you should happen to turn him up, you'll let me know, won't you? I told him I would, and he left by way of the east field. When I came back, Thomas my youngest, was sitting on the porch and looking out at the field. Thomas was six and not really old enough to help in the fields much. He tried. He wanted to be like his old man. He was a good boy. I sat next to him on the swing and looked out at the field too. What you looking at, kiddo? Just listening to him talk, daddy. That made me furrow my brow a little. Who? I asked, trying to hear what he was talking about. The scarecrows. Can't you hear them? I looked out at the corn, the pole beans, the fields of produce, and shuddered a little as I watched the breeze play amongst it. I suppose I could hear something, something like I had heard the night before. It 
was a strange kind of whispering. I could hear it amongst the rattle of stray corn husks, or the chuckle of bending stalks. But there was a harsher noise too. The creaking of old wooden stakes was audible in the wind now, and the chorus spoke of something very different. The call to the earth, the love of the land, the coming of the cold, the coming of the green. I shook my head and told Thomas not to stay out here too long. That night I was back in the barn, keeping watch over the crops. I didn't need the coffee tonight. I had only to think about what my son had said and remember what I had heard scuttling through the fields to keep my spine chilled. Autumn was in the air, and it sounded as if the spirits were at work. City folks sometimes forget that fall is a time of growth, but it's also a time of loss. We may lay back to prepare for the coming winter, but the earth must also prepare for that hard freeze. Sometimes the earth is greedier than even we can imagine. They started coming in about 11. I could see them parting the corn as they ran. I tried to follow them with my binoculars, but it was in vain. I would lose sight of them only to find a scarecrow a moment later. I was becoming frustrated because they never popped back up and the scarecrows would just go up. But how were they getting out again? They would make such a production of going into the field only to disappear. What the hell was going on? Were they burrowing out like moles? Then a screen door opened and my attention was pulled back to the house. I saw a little ghost in a long nightshirt streak out into the cropland, his bare feet smacking the cold earth. I called out to him, but he never stopped. I cried out pitifully as he entered the corn, but he was gone amongst it in an instant. I leapt from the loft, giving no concern to falling, and thankfully landed in a deep pile of hay. I was out and running in an instant, bolting for the place I had seen him disappear. I was hot on Thomas's heels as he dashed into the thick rows. His little nightgown, one of my old undershirts, flew behind him like a cape. Despite my long legs, he stayed one step ahead of me, and as we came into a patch of moonlight, I saw that he had stopped and stumbled to a halt myself. To this day, I don't know why I didn't just grab him. He was barely five feet away. I could have just reached out and grabbed him. Instead, I was almost transfixed as the sounds of those scarecrows rustled around me. He comes with the wind. He comes with the cold. He comes with the harvest. He demands his sacrifice. The words swirled around me, echoing in my head, carried by the wind, and they buffeted me like an angry sea. My son turned to look at me, his eyes reflecting the light of the moon. The green man comes, Daddy, he whispered, his voice high and cherubic. Then he simply sank into the ground, and I heard a scream rocket up my throat as he disappeared beneath the soil. No matter how long I clawed at the earth, I could not find him. After I dug a furrow four feet deep and still found not a trace of him, I was forced to give up. It wasn't until I turned to go that I heard the creak of a wooden post. The little scarecrow on the post was dressed only in my son's nightshirt, his charcoal face almost angelic. I don't know what to do. Thomas was taken three days ago and I haven't been able to leave the house since. I was still sitting at the kitchen table when Kara, my wife, got up. I was staring off into nothing, remembering how the little boy scarecrow had come up from the ground in the furrow I had dug as I looked for Thomas. She had shaken me, asking what was wrong, but I couldn't tell her much of anything. I was in a state of shock, not really sure how to explain what had happened. She became even more frantic when she couldn't find Thomas, and the talking had become shouting. She was getting scared, even in my current state I could tell, and that's why she called the police. Sheriff Dunlin came when she called, having just gotten out of bed when the operator called to tell him about my son. I smelled him before I saw him as he came to the porch. He walked into the kitchen, my wife making him leave his cigarette in the yard, and he sat down next to me at the table as I just stared out into space. Morning, Dale. 
he said, and it seemed that his words were the magic spell I'd been looking for to bring me out of my stupor. Morning, Sheriff, I answered quietly. I'm sorry to come out under such terrible circumstances, but we need to know where your boy is. I just told him that he was missing. I told him that he had run into the field suddenly, as I was perched in the barn, and became lost in the field. I told him that I had searched and searched, but I couldn't find him. I told him that I must have gotten turned around out in the field and had a nervous breakdown or something, like the one I'd had in the war. I had woken up just now, sitting at the table, with no clue how I had gotten there. I told him a load of bullcrap, and he asked my wife if he could make some calls from the house phone. An hour later, our dirt yard was full of state police cars, and the property was being searched thoroughly. They tromped through the fields, not looking twice at the scarecrows as they searched. They searched the barn, the sheds, the pond, the house, and everything in between. They asked about the dug-up area in the field, but I only shook my head. No answer I could give them would have been satisfactory. In the end, they told me they would put up his poster and asked if we had a recent photo of him. Kara provided one, and he said they would have the poster up by tomorrow. Then, all of them packed up in their cars and left. As they drove away, I suddenly wished I'd been more honest with him about what I'd seen. They might have thought me mad, but maybe they would have taken me with them instead of leaving me here, here where the whispers had already started again. It was afternoon by the time they left. Brad wanted to check the crops, but I just couldn't summon up the desire. I found myself sitting on the porch instead, looking at the crops, much the way Thomas had been doing yesterday. I watched the corn sway in the autumn breeze, heard the rattle of corn husks and discarded silk as they were pushed, and felt a hollowness inside myself. How does one cope after seeing the ground swallow up their child? I doubt I was the first to ask this question, but I just didn't know how to handle it. Thomas was gone, never coming back, and I was left behind. I jumped when my wife sat down next to me, realizing that it was dark now. I'd been sitting on the porch for what must have been hours, watching the corn sway and listening to the voices that swayed with it. They promised so many things. They promised peace in the field, peace amongst the corn, and it was all I could do not to rush out to the field and lose myself in that green sea. She threw a blanket over us and nestled against me as she joined me in my endless staring. What happened to him, Dale? What happened to Thomas? I couldn't answer her. I would never answer her. The things I had seen couldn't be vocalized. To speak of it would make it real, and if it were real, then it could happen again. Better that he drowned in the pond. Better that he had been murdered. To have my own farm simply devour him would be unthinkable. Come on, Dale. Please talk to me. She was pleading now, begging me for something that I couldn't give her. All I could do was sit there and hold that terrible knowledge inside myself. We sat in silence for nearly an hour before she kissed my cheek and said she was going to bed. As I sat on the porch, watching the corn sway, I heard that same skeletal voice as it moved with the wind. It told me how I could find peace amongst the crops, that all my cares would disappear once I was one with the land again. When I tell you that it took everything I had not to run out into the field, I mean it. I was sitting under the blanket, all my will used to keep me rooted to that spot when the farm played its ace. The corn rustled, and out walked Thomas. I sat forward, shocked, watching my son come stumbling out of the corn. He waved at me, a childish flop of his arm, and enticed me to join him. The corn waved in the breeze, its long arms seeming to lure me into its earthly embrace. They wanted me to be with them to be a part of them, and as I rose from the swing, that was what I fully intended to do. It wasn't until the moon hit Thomas just right that I saw the truth. 
it was nothing but the scarecrow. The one I had seen pop from the ground like one of my ears of corn waving in the breeze. I didn't I didn't know how he had come to be at the edge of the cornfield, a full fifty feet from where I had seen him sprout. But there he was. His thin arms no longer waved so much as they were moved by the breeze. I got up and went inside, turning my back on that waving scarecrow. I thought maybe I could sleep. But there would be no sleep for me that night. I was constantly pulled from it by a tapping at the bedroom window. When I would look up, I would see the ghostly face of my son, his eyes begging as he rapped on the glass. I would roll over, turning away from my little boy, and put my head under the pillow as he begged me to come with him. He would say anything to get me out of bed. He would say anything to get me out of the safety of my house. Daddy, it's so cold. Won't you come let me in? Daddy, I'm scared. Come outside. Please come outside, Daddy. It's nice in the field. You'll like it. The green man is coming, Daddy. He's going to get you either way. The scarecrows told me so. Daddy, 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 Daddy! On and on and on and on. The following day, I was like a ghost in my own house. My wife brought me breakfast in bed, Brad hovering by the door as he asked if I was going to be okay. Kara told him that I was fine, but she didn't seem to be so sure herself. She sat with me as I ate, clearly wanting to ask me something, but unable to form the words she wished to ask. When I was done eating, I just stared at the tray until she picked it up. She was looking at me with real worry, and when she turned to go, she stopped suddenly tray in hand. I know you saw something out there. Something, something that scared you. You need to talk about it, Dale. Just tell me what you saw. Maybe I can help. I looked at her and she must have seen something in my eyes that was more alarming than the way I was acting. You can't help me, Kara. And I can't help you. We're trapped here by those things. By the land. And there's no help for us. She left then, but I was never really alone. Whenever the wind blew, I could still hear Thomas as he begged me to come to the field. I lived in that stupor for two days, refusing to leave the house, refusing to speak to anyone. Brad and Carol were worried, coming to talk to me or try to get me to eat. I just sat there though, staring out the window, the wind rustling the corn and the scarecrows as they moved in closer. They didn't think I could see them as they gathered, but I could. They never left the safety of the corn, but I could see their faces as they congregated. They stared at me. They stared through me, and the voices on the wind told me how I would join their legion soon. When I suddenly noticed Greg, a white moon face at the foot of my bed, I jumped. It had been morning, only a moment before, but the shadows told me that it must be midday. He was kneeling, just looking at me, and I stared back at him for a few minutes, before a creepy smile stretched over his still childish face. I blinked, and his eyes always been so... jaundice? So... piss yellow? They're calling you, he said, almost lilting, and I glanced back at the window, as the sun seemed to darken before my very eyes. The window was obscured by a rogues gallery of squashed sackcloth faces. When I turned back to the foot of the bed, Greg was gone. When I looked back out the window, the scarecrows were gone. I sat up that night, staring into the darkness as my wife snored comfortably beside me. The wind still swirled around the house, a real late season gale and I heard the house creaking and the corn rustling. As the wind whipped, I heard the voices of the field, Thomas's voice amongst them, as it called me to come back to the land. They whistled and conjoled and begged, and over time, they wore me down. As my wife slept, I felt tears run down my face. Thomas, my boy.
boy had been taken by the land. He was all alone out there, and here I sat refusing him. He was nestled in the earth, and I was sitting here denying him my company, my love. A knocking at the window tore my head back towards it, and there he was. He was pale in the moonlight. My Thomas. His cherubic face was unaccusing, untempered by anger, graced only by confusion. His shirt was stained with dirt, the same dirt that had taken him, but he was pristine. He was unharmed, and he stared at me questioningly. Daddy, please come back to me. I'm so lonely here. So now, I'm sitting at the kitchen table, writing my final explanation to my wife and boys. I started writing this down so it would be fresh, but I think it's also in case something happens to me. You see, the voices are always in my head now. I can hear them as I sit at the table, writing. They follow me toy with me and tell me how nice it will be to be a part of his crop. Who is he? I don't know, but his words, the scarecrow's words, are becoming more and more tantalizing. I've laid in bed and listened for three days. I won't spend another day with this chorus in my brain. When I'm done, I think I'll take off my shoes and just walk out into the fields. It will be nice to feel the soil beneath my toes one last time. I can see that little scarecrow from the kitchen table. It's almost like he's waving to me, calling me over, telling me to return to the land. Thomas is with them, waving and calling to me too. I think, I think I can see Greg out there with them. It's dark and the porch light is off, but it seems like he's calling me there too. I think it's time for me to go. I never could say no to my boys. To say that it's been a hard three weeks would be an understatement. How would you quantify your son and husband disappearing without a trace? The sheriff came out to check the farm, but I know he didn't find any sign of foul play. Dale had been in the barn that night, the night Thomas had disappeared, watching for prowlers, but when I heard him come back, I had thought nothing of it. I had drifted off thinking that he might have decided to pack it in for the night and figured he'd come to bed soon and tell me he was giving up. When I awoke to an empty bed and a missing son, I was confused as I watched my husband slip deeper into a catatonic state over the next few days. My youngest son still unfound, I saw my confusion becoming despair. Now both have disappeared without a trace and I feel like resorting to catatonia myself. I jumped a little as one of those wooden poles creaked near me, the occupant turning as if to look at me from its lofty perch. I hated those two scarecrows. I wasn't fond of any of them, not after they had started appearing in droves, but these two specifically were my least favorite. They had continued to appear even after my husband's disappearance. One to five new scarecrows a night, and I would almost run into them some mornings as we brought in the harvest. These two, however, always made me sad when I saw them sad and more than a little bit angry. They stood nearly arm in arm, a little scarecrow in a white nightshirt, and a larger one with overalls and a straw hat. A pair of overalls that were very much the ones I had seen Dale wearing before he left that night. A straw hat that looked a lot like the one I had given him as a joke on Christmas. I reached out as I had done a thousand times, just meaning to push them over and let the earth claim them. I don't want to look at them anymore. They were just one more reminder of what I'd lost, and the emptiness inside me. I reached out, meaning to shove them down, but my hand betrayed me. I felt my eyes well up with impotent tears, wanting to be shed of these two, but not having the strength to follow through with my desires. Mama, are you okay? I jumped and turned to find Greg coming up behind me. I wanted to yell at him, but I knew it was just my frustration. No. Not just the frustration, I suppose. I was upset with my suddenly unhelpful son. Greg had been so odd the last few weeks, disappearing for long stretches of time before popping up unexpectedly. When my husband had expressed this concern, I had told him that this was just how boys his age were. Now that it was just the three of us, however, it was becoming unnerving. 
He seemed to be getting very good at cropping up when I least expected it. Yeah, dear, it's just that these scarecrows always make me a little sad. They... I don't know. It's nothing, I said, picking up the box of produce I had been picking and heading for the house. I'm sure you'll see them again. I stopped and turned around. Greg had been making cryptic little remarks like that for a while now, which was part of my frustration with him. I knew that boys became different as they aged, but Greg was changing into someone I didn't know anymore. He was quiet, often sullen, and I knew that he was leaving the house at night. He wasn't even bothering to be sneaky about it anymore. The screen door had woken me up several nights as it slammed shut, and a quick check would always show two empty beds, Thomas's and Greg's. One, one was supposed to be empty, but the other, the other just made me anxious when I saw it. I had searched for him a few times, but you would never find Greg if he didn't want to be found. Also, there were the voices in the fields, but I put that out of my head before it could take root. I turned to ask him exactly what he meant, but Greg was already gone. I shook my head and got moving again. The fields were suddenly giving me the creeps. Bradley and I loaded the vegetables into the truck, Greg not coming out of the field as usual. We packed the squash, corn, pumpkins, and beans into the back of the farm truck, and Brad slammed the tailgate as he whistled at the harvest. Despite our losses, it had been a good harvest this year. I suspected that it might be the last harvest for some time, though. I would have to take a hard look at the farm before next year and decide if a woman on her own could handle a farm's day-to-day -day needs. I supposed I could hire help, but... I wasn't sure I really wanted to be here after the disappearances. I sighed and climbed into the ratty old Ford. I heard the passenger door slide open and saw Bradley climbing in. He was getting tall. He was 16 and already as tall as his father. I was glad for him these days, but I put a hand out as he tried to climb in and told him to stay here. He said he wanted to come with me, and I could read the fear in his voice clear enough. What he meant was he didn't want to stay here with Greg. Keep an eye on your brother, I said, pitching my voice low. He's been acting oddly. But Mama, Bradley started, but I cut him off. The only butt I want to see is your butt walking back to the house. Please, just make sure he doesn't get lost too. He nodded, looking scared, but obeyed nonetheless. He was a good boy, my Bradley. As I pulled away, I prayed this wouldn't be the last time I saw those two. As the fields passed the window enveloping the road on either side, I kept my eyes forward. They had been playing tricks on me lately, and I wasn't in the mood for it today. I had seen faces in the fields, faces amongst the corn and beans that were hunkered down like ambushers. I knew they were just the scarecrows, those hateful golems that seemed to multiply nightly, but sometimes I thought I could see more familiar faces as well. I had seen the owner of the apothecary, the bartender at the cloudy schooner, the man who sold produce at a stand near the corner, Dale and Thomas as they stood amongst the swaying sea, hand in hand. I had stopped the first time I'd seen their faces, the two of them standing amongst the corn as it swayed in the early autumn breeze. I had leapt from the car and nearly tripped over the wooden fence as I bolted into the field. The corn was high, and it whipped at me as I ran towards them. I could see someone moving through the stalks, but... Despite my best efforts, I couldn't catch them. When Greg found me crying out there, the corn swaying around me as I wept, he just led me back to the house as Bradley went to drive the truck back. I had stopped looking at the corn after that. As I drove, I felt the tears welling up. That had been almost two weeks ago, back when I still thought there might be hope of my husband and son coming back. When I woke that first morning, I had honestly just thought that my husband had gone out to start farm chores, maybe finally coming out of his funk. After searching the house, the barn, both boys helping me search the fields, I knew something was wrong, though. The truck was still there, so I knew he hadn't gone into town. His fishing pole was still there, so I knew he hadn't gone to the fish pond, never mind that it was the wrong season for it. He wasn't anywhere. He was just gone and I was unsure how to process this so closely on the heels of Thomas's disappearance. The sheriff had come out again, searching the same ground we had already searched. In the end, though, he had said he would 
post Dale's picture with the others and keep an eye out for him. It seemed that he and Thomas weren't the only people to just go missing without a trace in this town. I pulled up to the feed store, wiping my eyes as I got out and waved at Fred. Fred's been buying our produce for years, but I've only recently had to have a hand in this part of the process. Dale had always handled the sales, handling the money, making the deals, and I had simply kept the house and raised the children. I was unprepared for widowhood, but my daddy had taught me enough about farming to get the crops in, and enough about dealing with people like Fred not to lose my shirt in the deal. As I left the store, I couldn't help but glance at the missing posters on the bulletin board, their fragile bodies pushed by the wind. It smelled like rain. It smelled like rain a lot these days, and I found myself gripping the poster of Dale and Thomas tightly. It wasn't even the newest. Three kids from the local high school had gone missing a few days ago. High school kids could sometimes be counted as runaways, but many of these people were adults, people with families, businesses, and positions of status. Before these three, the mayor's secretary had gone missing, the fire captain a few days before her, and even the owner of the general store had locked up and never come back. Some people had left on their own, spooked by all these disappearances, but they weren't pictured here, and the missing posters seemed to be stapled one on top of the other. I let the poster go and went back home. I needed to check on the boys. As I drove back, I saw the now empty field of the Gafford farm. They were larger than ours, but they had still managed to get their harvest in on time. Well, they had farmhands and helpers too, didn't they? As I drove past, I saw the wind push a scrawl of corn husk across the ground and heard something rattle against my senses. It was the same scattering of words I had heard for weeks. It invited me out to the field. It invited me to return to the earth. I shook my head and rolled up the window. I had been hearing that voice a lot lately. At first, it had almost sounded like the voice of Dale. I would hear him just outside the window at night sometimes. Thomas too, for that matter. And I would get out of bed and walk to the porch. I would dream that I could see them inviting me into the cornfield, but I would always wake up just before I stepped off the porch. Then I'd be standing in the moonlight, the corn swaying as the breeze promised peace amongst the swaying stalks. So far, I had been able to resist that call, though I always kind of wondered if these were the voices that had stolen my son and husband from me. I returned to find the farm in a state of utter chaos. Bradley was trying to stop Greg as he destroyed our field of pumpkins. It was pretty clear that he had come along after Greg started, probably heard him as he was hitting them with the axe handle, and come to investigate. He was swinging a rake at him, standing between him and the few pumpkins that were left, and Greg was breathing like a wounded animal as he tried to get around him. The field had been mostly harvested, only about 40 or so of the big gourds had remained, but now it was more like 10 or 12, and Bradley was trying to protect them. I was proud of him for it. The pumpkins were our cash crop. The farm is known for growing quality pumpkins, and we supply most of the pumpkins in the area for harvest festivals, pumpkin carvings, and all manner of other things. Why Greg was trying to ruin them, I had no idea. What in the hell is going on? I shouted, coming out of the truck and running into the mostly harvested field. The two stopped, looking at me sheepishly, but on Greg, the look seemed more frustrated that he hadn't gotten to finish. Bradley pointed at his brother, his breath wheezing in and out since he was so out of breath that he had caught him out here smashing the pumpkins. I felt something fall on my neck as he talked about how the two had started fighting, and I slapped a hand over it as a fat raindrop fell onto my head. I looked up at the sky hopelessly, dread welling up in me as the rain started coming down. Rain? In October? Out here, that could mean the death of the rest of our crop. It wasn't too bad right now. The weather was still about 60 while the sun was up, but it would quickly become colder, and tonight it could very well freeze. Dale would have known what to do about that, but I had no clue. I told Bradley to grab some pumpkins and get them into the barn. I didn't even bother with Greg. He was clearly off in his own little world, but he let us get the rest of the pumpkins out of the field. He ran away as we hustled the pumpkins inside, and I didn't see him for the rest of the night. Brad and I tried to get some of the squash and the beans in too, but it was getting dark, and we were both soaked to the bone. I looked for Greg as we ran inside. 
The rain was really coming down now, as the angry clouds blocked out what little sun we had left. When I realized that he wasn't inside either, I turned to go back for him. Bradley grabbed my arm as I tried to leave, though, and shook his head. He didn't say anything, but his face was so nakedly afraid that I almost couldn't bear to leave him. Greg, however, was also my son, and he needed me too. I stood on the porch and called Greg's name, my words disappearing into the wind. As I stood on the porch, I heard the wind pushing the voice of something to me. It was a voice I had heard much too often lately. It promised me peace, safety, and rest eternal if only I would come to the field. The stalks parted, stalks that should not have been there, and suddenly I was seeing them again. Dale held Thomas in his arms, Thomas asleep in his nightshirt as it fluttered in the wind. Greg stood with them, beckoning me as the three stood framed in the hazy moonlight, the rain still falling in sheets around them. They called me, begged me to come to them, and I suddenly felt my resolve wavering as my family stood ready to embrace me. I took a step forward. They seemed to grow excited, the rain bothering them not at all, as they waved and called me over. The boards creaked as I took another step. They all seemed to take a step backwards into the corn, and I felt the anxiety well up inside me. The rain was cold on my arms as I stepped onto the porch steps. I heard the door open then, and I didn't stop until Bradley called my name. Mama, please come back. Don't leave me too. I stood in the muddy yard for a moment before turning around and heading back inside. I looked back only once. Hopefully I have the strength to refuse tomorrow as well. But I don't, I don't know. The rain just keeps falling. It started the day my brother left. And now it just comes down and down and down. Mama keeps moving around the house like a rat in a trap. I can tell she wants to go out and look for Greg, but every time she goes out on the porch, she thinks better of it. Then she comes back inside and starts flitting around again. Then she might go out to the window and stare out into the rain, but only sometimes and never for very long. She sees something out there in the field, something she doesn't like. Normally, this would worry a person to death, but it beats the alternative. It's just the two of us now, Mama and I, and I'm almost loath to let her out of my sight. I barely stopped her from leaving the other night, and it was a very near thing. If I hadn't called her, she would have gone to the corn as well. I caught a glimpse of two scarecrows perched on the edge of the field, and you would have thought they were Dad and Tom as opposed to the ragged things wearing their clothes. That was three days ago. We've done little but watch the corn grow and the rainfall since then. The corn, that's still something I don't get. I can see from the front porch that the stalks of corn are waving, dancing in the pouring rain. The field stretched on and on forever, it seemed. A lush green and yellow sea that looked oh so inviting. I remember as a kid that I used to like to walk through the corn, running my fingers over the stalks and feeling utterly at peace as I drowned in that thick sea of green vegetation. But the corn can't be here. Mama and I picked it all last week. The field was empty before the rain started, save for a few stray stalks. That's, that's how she saw Greg and I when we were fighting in the field. That's how she got to us so quickly. That field should be mud and old corn husks, not a rippling bounty of corn that it is now. It seemed to have sprouted overnight and it hid my brother's activities from the eyes of those left in the house. That first night, I didn't really sleep well. I was tired, exhausted from the day's work, but the rain on the window was keeping me awake. It sounded like fingers drumming on the glass, and whenever I shut my eyes, I was treated to the image of thousands of fingers tap, tap, tapping on my window. They would come careening out of the inky blackness, thumping hard on the glass as they stretched from some monstrous hand. I lay awake, listening to the thumping rain as it hit again and again and again. The wind whistled against the house, creaking the boards and making them shift. I assumed the wind was pushing a tree against the window, as it did sometimes, but the thumping was irregular. It was not the usual scrape, scrape, scrape of the branches. 
It slapped woodenly against the window, threatening to break it as it tapped again and again. I finally sat up, unable to take that constant thumping, shining my flashlight into the dark room. Outside the window was a scarecrow, its bare wooden arms slapping at my window pane. I gasped, putting my hand over my mouth to stifle a scream. I'm not a brave boy. I'd never been a particularly courageous child, but I didn't want to wake my mother from what was likely a fitful sleep. The wind turned him in the beam of my flashlight, showing me a sack head with a jack-o'-lantern grin drawn in grease paint across his front. That wasn't one of ours. I had helped Daddy make those scarecrows, and this one wasn't one of the ones we'd made. He was dressed in blue overalls with a chambray shirt with a light and dark blue checkered pattern on it. His other hand was gloved, but the ungloved hand was not not knocking at my window. His black eyes seemed to stare at me, and I could feel malice behind them. There was hatred, but there was a promise in those eyes as well. As it stared at me, I could almost hear the words it spoke as the wind rattled them against the house. They were raspy, like my grandfather's voice before he had died a few years ago. I heard them on the wind, but I also seemed to hear them in my head. It was the voice of winter, the voice of harvest, the voice of the green. Coward boy, you are weak, but even you could make the soil strong. Come to the soil and make your suffering less. Give yourself to the green. It is the fate of your kind. Why fight the inevitable? I pulled the covers over my head, trying to block out the voice as I shuddered in my bed. That was when I heard the sound of my mother's door opening. Her footsteps were soft, hesitant as they came down the hall, walking slowly as though she were glancing around as she came. I could see her in my mind's eye, looking around fearfully as she walked down the hall towards the living room. She was... she was leaving me. I contemplated just staying under the covers letting her go, but the idea of being alone was too much to handle. I flew out of bed like an arrow and caught her just as she opened the door. Mama, where are you going? She looked back at me like she had been caught doing something wrong. She was half out the screen door, looking at the corn, the rain, and the wind shaking the door as she held it in her trembling hand. She kept looking between me and the field, her eyes yearning, spellbound, but still not quite gone yet. I... I just needed to check on your brother. I know he's out there in the rain, and I wanted to bring him some clothes. It's been raining so hard, and I want him to... come... come back inside, Mama. There's nothing out there for us. We just have to wait till the rain stops. Then we can get out of here and find some place less wet. I don't know why I said it, but she laughed like a crazy person when I did. She let the screen door close noisily and kissed me on the forehead as she headed back to bed. I heard her door close, but I knew I wasn't going back to my own bed. I pulled the old comforter off the couch and slept under it as the rain beat down on our old farmhouse, harder than it ever had. As I drifted off, I remember thinking that the house would flood soon. Surely it couldn't rain so much and not simply sweep us in the corn away, could it? My dreams that night were of our small wooden house rolling on the waves of corn, the house staying afloat as I desperately tried to steer it. There was a big wheel on the front porch, and I would turn the house to avoid the waves as they threatened to capsize us. In the water, there was a large gray something, and it would ram against the house every now and again as we sailed against the sea. I turned to avoid it, but suddenly it leapt from the water, a huge gray whale intent on murder and I heard the creak of a door just as I came awake. Mama was at the door again, and this time I had to physically lead her back to her room. I stuck a chair under the door this time and managed to sleep for the rest of the night. When I woke up, though, the rain was still falling. We spent today just sort of existing. Mama keeps going around the house, fitfully cleaning and straightening as the rain comes down outside. I didn't dare leave the house. Whatever was in the cornfield might decide to coax me out next but I did peek out the window. The ground was very soggy, puddles and little rivulets beginning to form, but it wasn't as high as I would have expected it to be. It was hard to tell since the sky was so dark. The sun seemed trapped behind the dark clouds, as much a prisoner as we were. When someone knocked on the door, I jumped, thinking it might be a scarecrow. 
or worse. Mama just stood there, looking at the door and seemed afraid to answer it too. The knocker wrapped his knuckles on the door a second time, and I found myself rising from the table. I didn't want to go, but I was the man of the house now, and such things were expected of me. I had taken a handful of hesitant steps when the knocker called out, asking if anyone was home. I blew a sigh of relief as I recognized Sheriff Dunlin's voice. I walked a little faster, but when Mama grabbed my hand, I came up short. Don't let him in. We don't need his help. We can figure this out. We can... We can... But whatever it was we could do died on her lips. We can't just leave him on the stoop, I said, pulling free and walking to the door to answer it. The sheriff was dressed in a duck-yellow rain slicker, his hat peeking out from under his hood, and for once, he did not have a cigarette in his mouth. He looked pretty scared. I'm glad to see you're safe. This rain's been coming down in buckets, and floods have started up everywhere. I figured I'd come and see if you needed rescuing, but it looks like the flooding isn't so bad out here. As he spoke, I could see his eyes straying to the field of corn that had seemingly sprung up like magic. I just thought... I, I might come out here to help, but the road's flooded, and as I was driving up, and I just, I might be... His eyes strayed more and more often to the rows of corn, and I could tell that the farm was preying on him. Sheriff, would you like to come inside? You can get out of the rain, and... Rachel, he breathed, turning away from me. I caught his arm and tried to pull him back, praying he hadn't been lost as well. He half turned back, seeming to notice me again, and for a moment, I thought I might have gotten through to him. He took a step towards the house, then another, but as his foot came down in the threshold, he turned back to the corn. A voice that only he could hear was calling, and it seemed that its siren song was greater than my own. He pulled away from me and started towards the cornfield, shouting the name of his ex-wife, the one who had run away with a trucker years ago if the town gossip was to be believed. I shouted for him as he plunged out into the muddy field, but it was too late. He was gone. The corn swallowed him as he ran into it, and I thought I saw Greg grinning like a doorman welcoming in a guest as the sheriff was lost to the green. I went back inside and told Mama that we were leaving. She seemed confused, standing like a doll as I slid the raincoat onto her. I pulled my own on and pulled on my rubber boots as well. If the sheriff had walked up here, then there must be a way to walk out again. We would just walk to town, away from the farm, and plan our next move once we were away from the whispering fields and the creaking scarecrows. Mama couldn't seem to manage her rubber boots, so I supposed her feet would just get wet. Better wet feet than the fate that awaited her out in the fields. We left, and I found myself nearly dragging Mama through the mud and water. Had it gotten deeper out here? It seemed like the water was higher than it had been only minutes ago. Mama kept looking back at the house, saying we should go back for Greg, that we couldn't just leave Greg alone. I ignored her, her jerking fits like a child who's not getting his way. If Greg wanted to come with us, he was more than welcome to stop playing in the field and come along. We walked down the muddy road until we came to the last thing I expected to find. The road had become a river. The sheriff's SUV was being pushed against a tree not too far from the gate the water shoving it easily. The river was high and broad, easily covering the two-lane road and spilling past its barriers. It had flooded the farm next door to ours, but as it poured into our field, the ground seemed to drink it greedily. I stared at the river in a state of high dismay. We would find no escape here. Suddenly, Mama jerked free and ran back towards the house, calling for Greg. I turned to give chase, and there he was, he was dressed in the same dirty overalls I had seen him wear the day he ran out, his chest bare beneath and his hair slicked up like some wild thing. As she ran for him, shouting his name pitifully, I ran after her and tried to stop what I knew would come next. She had ran to within ten feet of him, maybe less, when he darted back into the corn and she made to follow. I was a foot behind her, nearly within grasping range, but my panicked grasping fingers failed to connect and her rain slicker slipped maddeningly out of my hands. When she made to cut through the corn, I finally lunged at her, tackling her onto the muddy ground. Then, in the mud, we fought. She shrieked Greg's name and lashed out at me, kicking and screaming like a wild animal. She was half crazed, her fingernails cutting my cheek, her knee attempting to find its way into my groin, and her shrill voice calling me every name she knew would hurt me. 
She wanted me to get out of her way. She wanted me to stop trying to keep her from Greg. She wanted Daddy and Thomas and Greg and anyone but me. I finally just wrapped my arms around her, burying my face against her stomach as I cried and begged her not to leave me. I knew that once she left, it would only be a matter of time before I left too and was claimed by the field. She stopped as my tears wet her and her anger seemed to disappear. I looked up to find my mother seemingly back to normal. She hugged me, saying we should go inside and get out of the rain. I took her hand and followed her in, liking being led for a change. I would enjoy this lapse in sanity while I could. Who knew how long it would last? Bradley has gone to sleep at long last. I watched him slumber on the couch, stroking his head as he slept the sleep of the exhausted and the dead. I feel awful for what I must do now, but it's for the best. Bradley wouldn't understand what lies beyond the corn, what lies within the field. He thinks the green is something to be feared. Bradley was always such a fearful child. I want all of my children to have a place within the green, but Bradley is old enough to make his own choice. He must choose to come to him on his own, if he will. I feel bad for leaving him. I feel bad for using his trusting nature against him, but it was the only way. Bradley would never let me leave on my own. So, sitting in the mud, feeling his tears stain my dress, I felt a sudden ebb in my rage. This was my boy. This was my first and oldest child, and I was hurting him like some kind of psychopath. The way to break free was not by means of violence, but through love. So I pulled him up and took him inside. The green could wait a little longer. I had known what I must do and where I must go since I saw them from the porch. My precious Thomas, my loving husband, Greg, my boy, who knew the way all along. He had made the path very clear. I was unsure. The path was still new to me, so I had turned away. That night, however, as I lay in bed, the voices of the crops made my purpose clear. The green man wanted us all, wanted to reward us for tending his fields and taking care of his harvest. The field would accept us, change us, make us ready to become part of the green. I lay in bed for hours, listening to the scarecrows, the voices of the field, and all was made clear. But as clear as the path was, Bradley refused to see it. I knew then and there that I would have to leave him behind, but I could do it kindly. A mother never wants to hurt her children if she can help it. He will have to come before the altar all of his own. When we returned to the house, I asked him if he'd like some pork chops for dinner. Pork chops and mashed potatoes are Bradley's favorite, and I cooked peas and greens to go with them. He was ravenous. He hadn't eaten more than canned goods for days and I knew that a big meal would make him happy. I dug out the big skillet and got the pork chops from the icebox. He came to help me peel potatoes, mashing them into a bowl as he added water and salt. I took some peas from the freezer, along with collard greens and a half-eaten pie I had forgotten about. All the while, as I cooked and chatted and listened to Bradley's chatter, the voice of the green called to me. They were like wasps flying around a hive. I could feel the voices cascading over me, as they tried to convince me, convince me to leave the boy and come to the field. My face was a mask of serenity, but my mind was divided, constantly at odds with itself. Leave him behind! I plated the chops and watched the potatoes so they wouldn't scorch. He is unworthy of the green! I shook the water from the greens and put them on the plate next to the potatoes. The juice from the greens would run into the potatoes, and I knew that was just how Bradley liked it. The voices were making my hands shake, but I wanted to make tonight special. I was his mother, and what I was getting ready to do would hurt him a lot. He wouldn't understand, but he could at least have one last happy memory of me. Come to the green! Come to the green! Come to the green! He looked confused as I set the plate in front of him, cocking his head as the food steamed and the aromas tickled his nose. Where's... Where's your plate? I froze. I hadn't thought of that. I didn't really feel hungry. I hadn't felt hungry in days, and it seemed that only the voices sustained me. When was the last time I had taken a drink? 
I thought to myself, had I gone to the bathroom today? These questions seemed to push against the voices, but the voices shouted them down, telling me that the green was all I needed. The green would protect me. The green would sustain me. The green would make all my questions go away. Oh, I I'm not hungry. It's just been too much of an exciting day, and my stomach's in a knot, I told him. He clearly wanted to question this, but the smell of the chops was too enticing. He fell on the food like a hungry dog, mopping up the mashed potatoes with a piece of pork chop, moving the potatoes around to get the juice from the greens, and generally enjoying everything. I watched him eat, smiling at his enjoyment. Bradley was always my easiest child. Greg was a good boy, but he could be headstrong, like his father. Thomas was still small and prone to tantrums and grumpy spells. Bradley, however, had always taken after me. He was always there to help with the others, always there to help his father, not prone to feeling like a sissy if he helped Mama with the house chores. He smiled a lot, and he had not been prone to the sullenness boys sometimes got at his age. I reached out and touched his flax-colored hair, so similar to mine, and felt a tear slide down my cheek. "'What's wrong, Mama?' he asked, looking up at me with the piece of pork chop half in his mouth. I smiled and tucked his hair behind his ear. "'Nothing, nothing, baby. That hair's getting a little long. Maybe after dinner I could cut it for you.' He nodded, thanking me as he tucked into the remains of dinner. It was getting dark outside, what little daylight we had already slipping away. The green called to me, begging me, trying to threaten me, but I soothed it, even as I watched Bradley sop up the last of his food with a piece of bread. I had my whole life within the green. What was a few more hours with my son? We sat in the kitchen as I pulled a sheet around him and took out my scissors and my razor. We usually did this sort of thing on the front porch, but for obvious reasons, that would have been a mistake. Bradley would start shaking if he had to look at that sea of corn as it stretched out before him, and there would be no way I could deny the green if it were so close. So we sat inside, listening to the rainfall as I neatened his hair for him. Like mine, it was fine and soft, not a hint of coarseness to it, and I wondered if some girl had ever slid her fingers through it as they sat together. Had he ever kissed a girl? Held her hand? Told her he loved her? The hair fell down, making the sheet look dirty, as Bradley sat dutifully and let me work. He was so trusting, so oblivious to the tug of war that was taking place in my mind. The scissors made a snick, snick, snick sound as I cut, and if he noticed my hands shaking, he never commented on it. My mind was trembling, a mass of thoughts and voices, and I had to steady my scissors more than once before I could plunge them into his neck and end the charade. He was my son. I had carried him for nine months, and these voices, this green god, would have me throw all of that away and go dance in the fields. It kept sending me images of the corn swaying around me, and I felt the stalks beneath my fingers. The soil was wet and soothing as it oozed between my toes. The rain was warm, possessing none of the autumn chill I had felt earlier, and as I spun like a child at play beneath it, the soil opened up and took me into its loving, OUCH! Bradley put a hand up to his ear and turned back to look at me. I hadn't cut him badly, just a nick, but I stepped back as my hands began to tremble again. He pulled his fingers away, revealing a little blood, but not too much. I grabbed a towel from beside the sink and held it there, telling him I was sorry and how I hadn't meant to cut him. He just smiled. It's okay, Mama. It's been a pretty trying day. I finished his haircut, and he admired himself in the mirror afterwards. All I could see was the ugly cut on his ear, and my shame kept the voices away for a few minutes. As he showered, I sat on the couch and twisted my dress in my hands. It was worse now. It always got worse at night, and the multitudes were calling me home again. The scarecrows were calling me. Dale was calling me. Greg and Thomas were calling me. They were all calling, 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 and I felt as if I must go mad soon. It was too much. They were too much, and I didn't know how much longer I could sit here and deny them. My mind would unravel, as it had earlier, and I would be forced to go. They would make me leave, and there was nothing I could do about it. I was too weak to resist, too weak to do anything but give in, and then I would go to the green. And once there, 
I would be green eternal. The shower stopped, and I steadied myself as he came out. He mustn't see how rattled I was, or he would get suspicious. He walked to his room and hoped for a second that he would just go to bed. Once he was asleep, then I could leave. Once he was unconscious, I could slip away without this myriad of questions. He was tired, we were both tired, and after such a big meal, perhaps he might just go to... Mama? I looked up to find him standing there, washed and pajamaed, holding something I hadn't seen in a long time. I know, it's kind of babyish, but could you read to me? Like you did when I was small? I was speechless. He was holding a storybook, something I had read to all my kids, and looking at me bashfully. I had read them bedtime stories for years, but Bradley hadn't asked since he was ten. He would sometimes stand in the doorway as I read to his brothers, seeming to revel in the nostalgia of these old stories, and to have him ask for a story seemed to push the voices away again. He sat beside me on the couch, and I read him old tales of dark woods and fair princes, evil witches and beautiful princesses, where the endings were always happy and the heroes always won. He laid his head on my shoulder, much as he had done when he was small, and I saw him struggling to stay awake as the words wove a spell around him. His eyes were getting heavy, his body growing tired, and slowly his head became heavier and heavier as it pressed against me. When he began to snore, I went on reading to the end of the story. Then I laid him against a pillow, pulled the scratchy old comforter over him, and sat down to write this. I didn't want to leave without a word, as Dale had. I know this will be hard for Bradley, but I want him to know that I'm not abandoning him because of something he did. None of this is his fault, and I hope that he too can find his way into the green. I want my family to be complete within his halls, and I want all of us to be reunited beyond the veil. Come, come to the green, Bradley. Come be with your family again. Now I'm off to the fields. The earth calls to me, and I can no longer deny its clarion call. I return to the soil. I stood in the doorway, looking out at the corn. I'd woken up to an empty house and the patter of the rain. I spent the first hour crying, just trying to process it all. Mama was gone. She had left me alone. I was utterly alone in the house. My house now, I suppose. Once my eyes were dry, my throat was raw from sobbing, and I was filled with something I had never really experienced before. I had cried out all my pain, and it had been replaced with anger. This thing had taken everything from me, and now it meant to take the only thing I had left, my life. I pulled myself up from the couch and walked like a wraith through the house. The familiar boards creaked beneath my feet, boards I had known since I was a child. I just stood there in the hallway for what felt like hours, unsure of what to do. I watched the corn sway in the rain, watching for any sign of Greg, watching for any sign of the scarecrows. I was done weeping like a child. I spent that first day making plans. I was trapped here, that much was certain, but that didn't mean I had to give up without a fight. I needed to take stock of what I had to make a plan. My fear kept trying to resurface, like acid up my throat. I kept pushing it down. I couldn't afford to be scared right now. The second I gave in to that fear, I would be lost. I started in my parents' room. Daddy's rifle sat in the closet, and I hung it across my back by the strap. I found his binoculars on the nightstand, and took them as well, along with a thick green jacket from Daddy's days in the army. I ran a finger over the patches, wishing he had told me more about that time in the war. He didn't like to talk about it, always got a far away look when we asked. Mama said he'd had a nervous breakdown when he was in France, became catatonic like he had after Thomas had been taken. And that's why he was here, instead of being a name on a monument somewhere. The jacket was a little stiff from disuse, but it felt warm and worn in, just the thing to cut down on the winter chill. I turned, and that's when I saw the picture. It had been Daddy's Christmas present to Mama last year. All us boys were sitting on a bench, dressed in new suits, 
washed and looking dapper. Even Thomas, who'd just turned six the week before, was pressed and clean and smiling. Mama looked resplendent in a new dress, Daddy in his new suit, and the five of us made a really nice photo as we sat before a background with a Christmas tree and a roaring fire. Mama had cried over it when she had opened it on Christmas morning, and she had one in the living room and one for the bedroom. As I looked at it, I felt my tears try to well up again. When I heard the scuttling in the living room, I felt the picture drop from my hands. The glass shattered as it hit the floor, but I was already moving for the door. I led with the barrel of the rifle. I walked quietly from the room, hearing the scuttling as it came from the front. It sounded like an animal, its nails scrabbling on the wood as it moved on all fours. I swung wide as I came into the living room, putting my back to the wall as Daddy had always told us. The living room was empty, the sofa, the chairs, Daddy's recliner, and the bookcase sitting dustily in the preternatural silence. It was broken only by the thudding of the rain, the pounding becoming harder than I had ever heard it. How were we not underwater? Surely we must float away at some point, but still the house remained. This whole thing was becoming more and more like one of those pulp novels Mama never let us have in the general store. My hand shook a bit as I came around into the kitchen, setting my back to the front door as I swung in. The kitchen was pristine. Mama had just cleaned it recently, save for the water pouring into the back door. The door was listing, pushed by the wind and the rain, and the wind was bellowing in through the new breach. I pushed the door closed, securing the deadbolt that usually held it in place, and put my back against it as I sighed out in fear when the loud thump came from the back bedrooms. I felt that coil of dread wrap around my guts again. I made my feet as quiet as I could, my gun barrel leading as I walked towards the back where our rooms had been. That was where we slept, my parents' rooms being on the opposite end of the farmhouse, and as I walked into that cramped hallway, I could see the door to my brother's room standing open. The long shadow of a crouched someone snaked into the hall, rising on the wall as its grotesque form scrabbled at the floor for something. I steadied myself watching it paw at something, before rounding the corner and leveling the rifle at the intruder in my house. I found a hunkered Greg, looking every bit like an imp from hell. He was wet, his hair hanging around his face like wet pasta, his skinny pale chest looking sunken. The straps of his overalls were slung behind him, trailing like twin tails, and his pants were muddy and saturated with rainwater. As bad as he looked, his face was the worst part of it, his face looked like a wooden mask that someone had painted badly. He gritted his teeth and hissed at me, his claw-like hands reaching into a hole in the floor. I leveled the rifle at him, not wanting to shoot him, but I wasn't going to let him hurt me either. I, I don't want to hurt you, Greg. Don't make me, please, I begged, feeling my eyes misting as he turned to glare at me. Greg seemed torn. There was something in the floor hole that he really wanted. He had removed a loose board to get at it and he seemed to be weighing his options. I repeated my request again, my rifle shaking, and I was worried that I might put too much pressure on the trigger and shoot him by mistake. He took a step forward, and I felt my finger tighten without my command. The gun barked loudly, but Greg was back and hissing, the shaking barrel missing him. He made a grab for whatever was in the hole, but I put the next shot a little closer. The hole between us forced his retreat. His own window crashed as he jumped out of it, and I moved to watch him disappear once more into the swaying sea of green. I turned, meaning to leave, but my foot came down across the hole and I stumbled. I caught myself, but my eyes had seen the hole now. Inside was a child's collection of treasures. Baseball cards, marbles, old candy, bird feathers, animal bones, and a box that now lay on its side. I could guess pretty easily what he had been after in that hole, and I picked it up before leaving the room. I took a chair out of Thomas's room and propped it under the door before going back to the kitchen. I really didn't want him coming in through the window and catching me. The box contained some trinkets, some notes from a girl he'd met at school, and four pieces of paper. Two of them were torn out of my journal, and I wondered when he had had the time to do this. The last one was something I had written just yesterday, wrote it as Mama had cooked dinner. But the other one talked about Greg and I's meeting in the cornfield as he had built his altar. How had I not noticed these had been torn out? I suppose that the last few days had been a little hectic, but the last had been written while Greg was out in the field. 
I put it out of my mind for now, turning back to the other two. The top one must have been written by Mama just last night. As I read it, I felt my eyes well up. She had spilled her heart out in these final letters, and I almost couldn't bring myself to finish it. She had left. She had known that she would, but she tried to make my last few hours with her special. Even under the influence of the green, she had loved me. I pushed the sudden sorrow away before it could take hold on me again, and went to the next note. Daddy's letter to the family. Daddy's letter was enough to dry me up in short order. Daddy talked about the scarecrows, about how they moved through the corn and how they often came to visit him in the night. They had come to his window, they had spoken to him, and I realized that he had experienced the same things I had. Was Greg controlling them somehow? Did he control the corn, the scarecrows, the field even? What chilled me even more was his description of how Thomas had been taken. The ground had simply sucked him up and left a scarecrow in his place. I had been in the field hundreds of times since Thomas was taken, and the field had never swallowed either me or Mama up. It just didn't make... Something moved by the window, and I let the paper drop from my fingers. The darkness had gathered outside, and through the glare of the window, I could see the scarecrows gathering outside the window. They were pressing their sackcloth faces against it, cracks running up the glass as they piled against the pane. I fell sideways out of the chair as it clattered to the floor. I grabbed the rifle and ran for the hallway, hearing the windows crash behind me. The living room windows shattered inward as I slid on my sock feet, scarecrows boiling in as I weighed my options. Couldn't stay here, had to pick a room to run to, but every room in the house had at least one window, except for Thomas's room. I could hear the whispers of the hay-filled legs moving across the floor. They sounded like straw brooms sweeping the hardwood as they came after me, and I ran a little faster as I tried to get to the last room at the end of the hall. Thomas had been given the smallest room. I think it had been a storage room before he was born, and I could see the bright colored wallpaper from here as I ran. Mama had been keeping the door open and the light on, hoping Thomas would come back, but I suppose that she was with him now, somewhere I was in no hurry to get to. I pushed my back against the door as I threw it shut, not wanting to see the horde of straw men boiling up the hall after me. I closed my eyes, bracing myself for the coming assault. My dread was at odds with the colorful posters and wallpaper that graced the walls. My foot jangled one of the toys still sitting on his floor, and the happy clown wobbled on its oblong base. It seemed so surreal to be sitting here menaced by some faceless boogeyman. How many times had I stood in the doorway to this room and listened to Mama read to Thomas and Greg? She would smile at me every now and again, noticing me listening as I remembered a time when I was small and she'd read me to sleep. I was still leaning, thinking about old times, when I realized how quiet it was in the hallway. No, no one had rammed the door or even shoved against it. There had been enough scarecrows in the house to easily push through the door, but there hadn't even been a rattle. I pressed my ear to the door, listening for scrapes of straw feet, but there was nothing, nothing but the ceaseless fall of the rain. My hands shook as I wrapped it around the doorknob. Just a quick peek, that couldn't hurt anything. I opened the door just a crack and stuck my eye to the separation. At first I thought the hallway was really dark. Then I realized I was eye to eye with the sackcloth face of a scarecrow. I slammed the door, but not before an arm snaked into the gap and tried to pry the door open again. The straw did little to stop the door from closing, but it did continue to wiggle as the closed door held in place. I crawled backwards, watching the arm dance and writhe as the light suddenly went out. I was plunged in darkness, no window there to cast any light, and I fumbled my flashlight from my pocket as I looked for something to brace against the door. As I slid the dresser into place, I heard them batter the door with their flimsy bodies. The nightstand and the bed came next, and I curled my knees up to my chest as I put my back against the furniture. They were thumping and smashing against the door, rattling it slightly as their numbers increased, and I remember the fear being the only thing keeping me awake. I had run too much adrenaline through my body today, experienced too much in the last few hours, and now my body was at odds with my fear. I passed out, quivering against the pile of furniture, not sure if I would ever wake up. Day 2. I awoke to silence in the house. Pushing the furniture aside, I could see the barren hallway. No sign of the night before his attack. The power was still out, and I couldn't muster the courage to go check the box around back. 
The sun was out, but it might as well have been night. The rain was still falling, thick clouds obscuring the sun, and I felt as though I lived in a state of perpetual dusk. The windows seemed to be the only evidence that I hadn't been dreaming. All the windows in the house had been broken, and the box and its contents were missing. Luckily, I had put my journal in my pocket. After sweeping up the glass, I pinned the passage you just read. The writing was like a cleansing, flushing my fears and doubts and galvanizing me in a way that I had never been able to. I had always enjoyed the act of journal writing, the birthing of thoughts and ideas, and the act often soothed my anxiety. That done, I ate a can of beans from the cupboard and set to work. By noon, I had assembled my tools on the kitchen table. Thirty rounds for the rifle, a crowbar that Daddy had put under the sink, six bottles of moonshine, a lighter from Daddy's dresser, a razor from Mama's sewing kit, thirty or so mason jars from the pantry, the flashlight, binoculars, and some lighter fluid from under the sink. It was a small collection of tools, but it was better than nothing. I spent some time getting everything ready, and then stepped out onto the porch. I stood, watching the rain come down in buckets. The mason jars I had poured the moonshine into sloshed as I raised it to light the makeshift fuse. It had been easy to stuff the rags down into the lids, making a small hole for them, and it would conserve the moonshine some. I didn't know how long I would need to hold out here, but I knew that I would trade all six bottles if I could burn that hateful corn seed to the ground. I stared out at the hateful cornfield, the swaying edifice of my despair, and prepared to light the first jar. As the rag burned, the voices I had been hearing since the rain began changed slightly. It had always been hateful, needling, the voice that told me I was weak and worthless. Its words felt like hornets on my skin, and the scuttling voice had done nothing but drive my anxiety. Now, however, it had turned placating, almost frightened, as it begged me not to do this thing in haste. The corn, it seemed, was important. Let's see if it burned. The jar flew end over end as it careened towards the corn, spouting flames as the moonshine soaked the rag and fell amidst the corn. For a moment, I worried that it wouldn't take. The corn would be too wet. The fuel wouldn't catch. The moonshine wouldn't be pure enough to burn for long. When the stalks began to burn, however, I knew my fears had been unfounded. I grabbed another jar and sent more fuel sailing towards the corn. The voice began to scream as the flames licked the tall stalks. It told me how I had ruined it, how my death would be swift, how there would be no mercy for me now. It told me that I would never find joy in the soil. It told me my family would never accept me now that I had ruined his blessings. I didn't care. I just kept lighting the jars and throwing them into the field. Rain or not, the corn burned. You're only delaying the inevitable, Bradley. I stopped, the flames from the lighter not having kissed the rag yet, and looked at Greg as he stepped out of the corn. He looked different from the goblin I had seen yesterday. His clothes were clean, his hair was slicked up, and he possessed none of the rage I had seen the night before. Quite the contrary, he seemed almost gleeful. Unless you've come to help me burn the corn down, Greg, I don't give a damn what you have to say. You can't burn the corn, Bradley, no more than you can stop Mama from leaving. I turned and gritted my teeth at him, wanting nothing so much as to smash the jar in his face. Why, Greg? Why the hell are you doing this? We're brothers, for Christ's sake. This is as much your home as it is mine. I'm the second son of a second son, Bradley. Once you inherit the farm, what's left for me? I'd end up in the army like Daddy, and return from whatever war comes next with money and a plot of dirt to squander on my own firstborn. You think that because you are first, that you deserve this land, but it's already been given to me by a higher authority. I... I never felt that way, Greg. There would always be a place here for you. I don't need all of this. We can share it. Just come back and stop acting like this. I don't understand what happened in the woods, but... He cut me off. What happened in the woods? What happened in the woods is that you forsook me. You left me to die at the hands of some shapeless nightmare. But I forgive you. You were worried it had killed me. Well, it did. Your brother died in the woods that night. But it was your cowardice that killed me, not the one who took me. I gritted my teeth, knowing he was right, but not understanding how he could throw everything away because of my lapse in bravery. I, I said I was sorry. 
What more do you want from me? You would kill our entire family because I got scared and didn't protect you one time? Kill our family? Oh no, I have united them, brought them together in the soil. But you will never know that place. You are the last because I know that such a thing would be the greatest hell you could ever experience. If I could leave you alive to live with the knowledge that your cowardice has made you an exile from this family, I would. Unfortunately, he says that you must be my sacrifice. Your... your what? I asked the flame in the corn already dying as the rain threatened it. Even as the flames licked at it, the corn was already going out. You'll see in time. For now, just enjoy what remains of your pathetic life, Greg said, walking back into the corn. Day three, I, s I slept poorly last night. I spent the night in Thomas's room and I was once again attacked. They threw themselves at the door, pushing and slamming at it. I heard the frame groaning against the weight of their numbers and I shoved against the barrier to keep it at bay. They are... They're limitless. Fearless. But they've left with the sun. I came out to find nothing in the hall to let me know that they had been there at all, except the splintered door frame. I tried to sleep during the day, but just as my eyes would slip closed, the scarecrows would start slamming against the door again. This surprised me because I... I had believed they couldn't move in the daylight. I had believed that the daylight would provide me some safety, as my adrenaline ran heavy in my blood. I learned that I had been wrong. Day 4. I was shaken out of a thin sleep last night, by the floor groaning in protest. As I came awake, the floor started to crack and creak, the boards bowing as something pushed at them. The walls too were groaning, and the ceiling was sending a powder of d dust down onto my head. The agitated scream of wood was everywhere, and as the first board snapped, I saw the source of the intrusion. Corn. It was corn. The corn stalks had grown under the house, through the walls, all over the roof. The corn was coming to get me. The corn was surrounding me, surging, rolling waves of green. I ran from it, trying to get the barrier away from the door, but as the door came open, I was pushed into the growing mass by sheaves of corn that grew straight up the hall. As it enveloped me in an earthy cocoon, I began to scream, clawing at the corn as I tried to escape its compressing walls. I woke up screaming, my hands bloody since I had lashed out at the furniture around me. I've wrapped my hands in strips of my own shirt, but... They ache badly. I'm keeping this journal more out of a sense of duty than anything. I think... I think it may be all that's keeping me sane. Day 5. I keep writing, but the words don't even make sense anymore. My life has become a series of waking terror, fueled by adrenaline. I can't trust anything. Not my memories, not my reality, not even this goddamn journal. The words have started jumping off the page and running out the hole in the wall even as I write them. Last night when I awoke from my corn dream, I saw lights outside the holes in the wall. The holes. I almost forgot about them. I thought I saw the scarecrows trying to break in. So, I shot at them. Turns out, I guess they weren't real. Because now, there are some pretty big bullet holes in the wall where I tried to shoot at the scarecrows. I see them looking through them now, though. They come to peek at me like an animal in the zoo. I don't shoot at them anymore. It just seems to make them come back more often. But, but, but I was talking about the lights. There were fires in the corn, not like the ones I had lit. There was rhythmic chanting, strange sounds I could hear, garbled through the holes in the wall. 
I could hear something with a thousand voices calling him. I couldn't sleep after that. All I could do is lay there and think of the chanting, listen to the voices, tell me that it was already over. I'd burn this house to the ground if I could. I think that today they will get me. I can't possibly stay awake another second. I can hear something heavier than scarecrows coming in the house now. My eyes are closing. I'm losing stretches of time every time I blink awake. It won't, it won't be long now. I took him from the house myself. He never stirred, never fought, and I was worried that he was dead for half a heartbeat. The rain came down as we moved through the corn, the scarecrows and I spiriting him to his final rest. The rain had been coming down for days, or maybe weeks, perhaps even years. Who can say? The farm has become a world unto itself, and I am the master of it all. I took him to the barren patch of field. I took him to the altar. He stirred as we pressed him to his knees. He gazed up at the altar, seeing it again, and hung his head down in the rain. His flax-colored hair hung limp and wet as the rain came down around him, and it almost looked like tears as his pants legs soaked up the mud. To his credit, he didn't run. He didn't beg. He was cowed and defeated at the end of his life. It appeared that exhaustion had given him the courage he always lacked in life. Too late, though. Much too late. The straw men gathered around the altar, watching as the sun set, though you couldn't tell it. The sky has been dark for as long as I can remember, and it would stay dark until the sacrifice was made. Then all this would truly be mine. I would finally have my just desserts, and I would finally see my brother punished for his betrayal. The rain came down, and the scarecrows gathered. The time had begun. My tongue spoke words that my mind could not fathom. The wind repeated those arcane phrases as I stepped behind Bradley. The scarecrows rustled, silent as the grave, as Mama's razor came free of my sleeve. The corn stalks shuddered in the hearty breeze as the cold metal pressed against his throat. I closed my eyes, willing him to speak, to beg, to do anything at all before I ended his worthless life. But he only bent in the mud, saying nothing at all. He never even grunted when I split his flesh and let his blood patter to the field. The altar drank him dry when I pushed him over and let him die against the stones. The rain came down as he lay amongst the coarse stones. The scarecrows stood stock still as the wind buffeted them. I too stood like a statue as I watched the altar. The wet stones spattered red as they hunkered like so much useless rock. The wind whistled through the corn stalks as I stood there suddenly shivering under the buffet of the cold autumn air. Around me, the world remained much the same. I started to get nervous. Was I wrong? H had I been tricked? I had met this creature in the woods. He had spoken to me about what must be done. He had promised me service for my devotion, reward for my sacrifice, but now I was left with only the company of these hay constructs and the whistling wind. What was I going to do? What would I tell the people of the town? Was there still a town? How, how would I? Do you doubt he who has given you so much? I jumped as the altar pulsed with a murky aura. The rocks began to thicken, to frost and the small box in the center began to swim with a foul soup. As I stood, the wind whipping past my ears, I could hear the clop of hooves and the clank of armor. Something was thundering out of the hole, growing closer and closer. As it grew, 
I began to worry that it wouldn't fit through the opening I had made. The altar would be too small. He wouldn't fit. I had come all this way to be thwarted by my own inadequacies. I worried right up until his steed plunged from the altar like a new child from its placental sack. The hooves of that midnight charger, that seven-foot destrier of raven muscle, sank into the mud of my simple farmyard. Its rider was no more ineloquent. His armor was a perfect mix of glacier blue and summer green, the plates appearing moss-like in their sheen. His helmet bore a rack of magnificent antlers, and across his back hung a huge two-handed sword. The eyes beneath his helmet were jack-o'-lantern's coals, and his voice boomed out as though from the throat of a bell. Thank you, loyal and noble servant. You have brought me forth. You have paid me tribute, and now you shall have your reward. The lands of your fathers are yours, so saith the Lord of Winter, the bringer of the cold, the reaper of the harvest, and the lamentation of the unprepared. Green man, green man, green man, green man. The wind seemed to chant his name the scarecrows vibrating those very words, and the cold, muddy land felt as though it vibrated at his presence as he stood before me. The green man had come. I heard the scrape of a blade on a frozen window, the sound of an icicle as it pierces the lake, and looked up to see that monstrous sword gripped within his mailed hand. I cowered, believing that this would be my reward, my comeuppance for my betrayal. But he only laughed as I knelt in the mud. When he slid from his horse, his mailed feet shook the earth, and the mud froze as he touched it. He stood before me, towered over me, and I finally looked up to find the icy point of that great weapon before my face. Even now, you believe I would kill you? No, you are my creature. Your fields and lands belong to me, and though I allow you to till them, farmer, they remain my fief and domain. You will give me sacrifice, crop, and blood so that I may walk amongst my lands, and for that I shall grant you your reward. He slipped the tip into my shoulder, only an inch, but the blade's cold was worse than any winter blizzard. I felt like frostbite ran through me, and I cried out as his power ravaged me. When he pulled free, my every breath was that of steam and cold. Over time, my fingers would take on a pallor, my feet would thicken, my toes blacken, and my eyes would forever be dark and ring. I would live, have lived, for so many years under his rule. I lost much when the green man made me his emissary, but I gained so much more. The rain still falls upon my father's land. The city was washed away, lying now beneath the lake, but still there are people that live upon the shore. They fish the water, take the water for their town, and even come to Towsy Island on occasions. They see the trees that grow here. They see the corn, the beans, the squash, but never a pumpkin. No, never that. They come to take and explore, but few of them leave the island again. Towsy Island is greedier than even they know sometimes. It takes all it can from a man or a boy, but sometimes it gives you more than you can understand. The crops grow year-round. The rain keeps the island shrouded in mist. The altar sometimes tastes its share of blood. The green man is appeased. The farmhands, three men and a woman, all still dirty from the field, looked up from their meal as they ate. I hadn't touched my own food, my stew sitting cold before me, and none of them seemed to want to touch theirs either. They had come to this island to help me with my crops, to help with the harvest as I had requested, but 
After that story, all were thinking it might be high time to leave. The crops were in now. This was their last night on Towsie Island before they left for Sarah's parents' house. And they were suddenly wondering if they could make that trek in the dark. Paul blew out a long breath. <sighs> Dang, Greg. That was quite a dinner story. You didn't tell us you were such a tale teller. I smiled. My brother always said I had a flair for the macabre. He was always terrified of my stories. But I suppose that this one might be in poor taste. Sarah cleared her throat, picking up plates as she made to do the dishes. It certainly was scary. You should write them down. You have a real knack for stories. Oh, I may one day. But I suppose you'd all like to get to bed. It's late, and you have a long trip tomorrow. They all said their good nights and headed for the rooms down the hall. The rooms that had once belonged to my brothers. I waited for them to close their doors before making my way to the barn. I would need to get ready for tonight's work. It was nearly the appointed time, and it was best not to keep him waiting. They had asked about the strange rock pile over the last four weeks. It was actually what had brought the story on in the first place. I had told them it was just a geological formation that my father had been unable to move. I opened the desk and took out the razor I had used to end Bradley's life. It was sharp, not a speck of blood on the blade or the handle, and I gave it a few licks across the whetstone just to be sure. It would need to be sharp for tonight's work. They would be terrified when the scarecrows came for them, and I wanted their passing to be as easy as possible. They really had been good farmhands, and they deserved more than the $200 apiece I had offered them. They deserved a place in his halls where they would want for nothing ever again. I heard the screen door slap as someone forgot to catch it, and looked out the door to see four figures running from the house. They all stopped and gawked at the field of corn that had sprung up, seemingly at will, a thick and bountiful crop that I would have easily brought in myself. I did bring it in myself from time to time, selling it in town when I needed something, but I couldn't very well sacrifice the corn. That's why I needed the farm hands that no one would miss from time to time. Paul pulled Sarah into the corn, Fred and Mark following after. I sighed. It was always more difficult when they ran, but in the end, it would all be the same. My first sacrifice had been four, and thus, so would this one. The green man would have his due. Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. I do hope you've enjoyed this compilation of the Towsy Homestead. If you do, please let me know. I may put together a couple of my other long part series. You know, something a little more digestible. So, now that the show's over, let's thank our patrons, shall we? Thanks to Leslie Lou Rill for being our spooky skeleton tier contributor. Thanks, Leslie. We just couldn't do it without you. Wouldn't you like to be a spooky skeleton tier contributor in this the spookiest time of the year? If so, come on down to Patreon. For just $5 a month, you too can be a spooky skeleton tier contributor. Of course, if you'd rather just come back every week for a story, I totally understand. And I love to tell you stories every week. So, till next time, Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.